Hello everyone and welcome to the done in one manufacturing with a spree cam and KME CNC. My name is Dan Perry. I'm the Eastern Applications Manager with a spree. And today we actually have a couple different presenters. So I'll go ahead and introduce them to you. So Grant Hewson is our spree solution specialist. He will be the first presenter. And then Jerome Mezasama is an applications engineer with KME, and he will be presenting after Grant. And, you know, as we're going through the presentation, if you guys want to ask some questions, you can feel free to do so using the GoToWebinar utility on the right-hand side of your screen. You can type your questions in. I'll be answering them live throughout the presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll do some live Q&A where we'll kind of go over some of the, the more frequently asked questions that have transpired throughout the session. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Grant and we'll get started. Hello everyone and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Grant Hewson. I'm a solution specialist for Spree. In today's example, we're gonna talk about going from a prototype or short run to a full production run. This is a common scenario in many machine shops. We will explore our options and show the power of a Spree and KME to streamline this process. In our example machine shop, we have three machines available. Our Mazak Variaxis, I-700T, which is a full five axis vertical milling machine. We have our, our Akuma MB5000H2, which is a four axis horizontal milling machine with a pallet changer. And then we have our Doosan DNM6700. This is a three axis vertical milling machine. We received an order for 50 trigger guards. On the left side, is our customer 3D model and the right side our finished part inside of a spree. This job is only a few parts, so we're gonna run it on the very axis. This is a five axis machine, so we can do it in one setup and one fixture. This is our plan for the part. Our Mazak very axis for our work holding, we have our riser, base plate, and self-centering vise. This comes from our extensive library, well, which I'll get into during our simulation. And then we have our finished part. All right, let's start our simulation. I'm going to drag my views window onto my other screen to keep our simulation clear when I change views throughout the presentation. I mentioned our tooling and work holding library. We now online have over 8,000 tooling items for milling, turning, and probing to help you building your tool assemblies. This is everything from lathe and mill tools to many machine adaptive interfaces such as VDI and BMT, and adaptive in interfaces for specific machine tools. We also have a broad range of work holding. We have over 700 fixture components. This includes clamps, vices, chucks, risers, many different names from Kurt, Fifth Axis, Jurgens, and so, so on. We have a bunch. So the customers received the parts and they love the fit and finish of them. And so that, now they've decided to place an order for 5,000. Now the question being is how can we possibly hit those production numbers? And that's where KME comes into play. KME has an extensive set of fourth and fifth axis trunnion and rotary tables to help us out. So for our production run, we're gonna go ahead and use our Akuma and we're going to put on the KME tombstone, which has four separate plates on it, which all can individually spin. And this is gonna give us the ability to turn this four axis machine into a five axis machine with four individual rotary axes. And for our Doosan, we're going to load up a three station trunnion, and that's gonna give us the ability to do three parts per cycle. Now we're gonna hop back into a spree. I'm gonna go ahead and turn back on our machine exit our simulation, go to our home ribbon, and select our machine setup. I'm going to go ahead and select machine, and now we're going to swap our machines for the Okuma. Now 
Now the Akuma is loaded, I'm going to go ahead and orient so we can see inside of it. And I'm going to press OK. So next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and select our machine, select rotary axis, and pick our trunnion. Excuse me, pick our tombstone. Once that's there, I'm going to go ahead and press OK. And now we're going to cut starting at our vise and then paste it on the new tombstone in each position we want. So in this case, we're going to do it four times. All right, so next I'm going to go ahead and delete the uh, old picture since we've already cut the um, vice work pieces from the other one now. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the I-700 fixture. I'm going to go ahead and change our view to side view. I'm going to toggle the visibility of our machine. I'm going to press OK. And now Esprit is automatically going to create our single program into four programs all together. So what are links? Uh, what do links do and why do they rebuild each time we change a machine? So in Esprit, we optimize and automatically calculate considering the machine kinematics as well as all geometric entities, such as machines, stock, fixtures, and tables. When we switch machines in Esprit, it calculates all moves, taking into account the new machine settings. Clearance, linear, linear and rotary, maximum angles for safer tracks, and safe location for large rotary changes. It also takes into account rounding increments for non-cutting moves. This creates nice, nice and easy round numbers for you to read inside of your NC code. So let's go ahead and simulate. As we can see now, our program that originally was for one part is now machining four parts. This is not cutting each part one by one. The program has been automatically optimized to cut four parts together using our digital twin. For those who don't know, our digital twin is a virtual copy of your machine tool, fixture, vices, and tools, etc. Esprit automatically calculates the moves based upon the new machine settings. This really shows the power of Esprit. This part started on a five axis, Mazak very axis with one part. We changed the machine to an Okuma four axis horizontal, added the KME rotary tombstone, cut the single part, and then pasted it four times onto our new fixture. This required no reprogramming. Very impressive. So now that the Akuma is finished, we're going to go ahead and do one more machine swap with the deuce on. So I'm going to go ahead and turn back on the machine, go to my machine setup, and double click on our machine and select our deuce on. Now that it's loaded, I'm going to go ahead and orient it correctly. Now we're going to add a rotary axis, which is going to be our trunnion. Now we're going to cut one of the parts from our previous tombstone and paste it on each of the three locations for our trunnion and press apply. Now I'm going to delete the existing tombstone from the Okuma. I'm going to press OK. And now our program is going to rebuild itself with three parts instead of four, with a trunnion instead of a fourth axis plus one on the Akuma. OK, let's go ahead and uh, simulate our new program here. So as you can see, once again, we took an existing program, and by simply copying and pasting it on our new rotary axes inside of a new machine, Esprit automatically rebuilt everything including optimizing the positions and operations for our three parts. And I want to stress uh, one more time that once again, this took no part reprogramming. We just simply copied and pasted our existing program into a new fixture on a new machine, and S3 was able to rebuild all of the necessary motions to suit that machine with our new part.
Now that the simulation is finished, I'd like to show an example of how powerful our digital twin is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up our machine setup. I'm going to go ahead and select our trunnion. I'm going to adjust our position in Y by an additional 10 inches, pushing it to the front of the table. When I press OK, if we look to the right, we'll see our links rebuilding. But we're going to notice we have some errors now. These errors are telling us that the link position is beyond the machine axes, and we're getting multiple ones of these. It has happened, we're going to be running out of travel um, on our parts. So if I simply switch back our offset to the original distance and press OK, we can see that the links all rebuild properly. Now that we've finished our simulation, let's talk about what it takes to make one of these fixtures from scratch. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to File, New, and create a blank document. And now I need to import our 3D model. I can do that by going to File, Import. This model was su supplied to me by KME. So I'm going to go ahead and first, I'm going to go ahead and copy the name of the fixture itself. And I'm going to go ahead and select the file. I'm going to run the CAD diagnostic. That's going to make sure our solids are watertight and it looks like they're good to go. So now I'm going to create a new layer that's going to be named the name of our fixture. Now I'm going to move those solids into that layer by using the right click, copy, attributes, layer, move. Just checking that works. Everything looks good here. So the first thing I'm going to do is figure out the position of the center point of our faceplate. I can do that by simply selecting the, fa the faceplate, going to our solids tab, and I can see there the center position, which is 325 in Y and 47 in Z. So I need to remember those numbers. So the next thing we're going to need to do is translate our faceplate to our origin. I'm going to do that doing the manipulation translate function. For our point one, I'm going to select the center of our platter there. I can do that by simply hovering my mouse over the center of it. And now for our second point, it's going to be our origin, which is our 0, 0, 0 move that by pressing apply and as you can see now our faceplate is now at our origin position. So what I need to do next is create two planes. I'm going to create one called FA underscore one and a second plane called WA underscore one. I'm going to go ahead and press enter. I'll explain what those are in the next little section. So now I'm going to go ahead and highlight our new fixture. Go to file save as and this needs to be saved as our file name. And then our file type must be fixturefile.gdml. So once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and press save. And now we finished the Esprit portion of building this, this fixture. Now it's time to open up Machine Tool Builder. So what is Machine Tool Builder? MTB is a software that we use to build the machines. That includes axis configuration, travel limits, speeds, and max RPMs. We build fixtures with additional rotary axes, vices and chucks to set the jaw travel, and lathe tool blocks live to set the rotation direction and max RPM. So what can be built in, in Esprit without Machine Tool Builder? So any static tool holders, mill, lathe, anything like that can be built inside of Esprit, and any static uh, fixtures such as risers and base plates, uh, those do not need to be built inside of Machine Tool Builder. Now that we're inside of Machine Tool Builder, we need to open the fixture that we just built inside of Esprit. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is create a new group. In this group, we need to name our fixture adapter name. So in this case here, we're going to call this Center. Now we need to add an item to this, which is going to be a rotary axis. This rotary axis 
needs to be called C1 in order to correspond with KME's naming convention. Then we're going to add an additional group inside of that, which we're going to call C1 underscore solids. So now I need to set the translation points, which we which we found inside of a spree. So that was 135 and Y, sorry, 325 and Y, and then 47 and Z. Now that we've set our translation point, we can see where that is there now. But first, I'm going to go ahead and set our max rotation limits and max feed rates. And then we're going to set our max RPM to 10. Now we're going to find our solid. And we're going to drag it into the solid group. And we're going to take both of our adapters and drag them inside the group as well. Now that that's finished, we need to now test our fixture to make sure there's no collisions. We're going to do that by actually jogging the axis, as you can see here. And it's fitting in both directions here. It looks like we're good to go. And the last thing we need to do now is to combine the remainder of our solids into one solid. We can do that by right clicking, combine. All right, this looks good. We can go ahead and go file, save, and our fixture should now be ready for a spree. Now let's take a look at some example G code. Here it's done with three sub programs, powering up the fixture, rotation, and rotation plus confirmation. So now let's test our fixture. We're gonna go back into a spree and we're gonna change our machine from our Doosan back to our Kuma. Now that the machine is loaded, we're gonna go ahead and load our rotary table. And now we're gonna simply cut one of the parts and paste it onto our new fixture and delete the old fixture. Now we're going to press OK, and now Esprit is going to recalculate with just one part. And you can see on the right-hand side of our, all of our links we're building again, they're all good to go. We can simulate our part, and it looks like we're good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for, for the KME Esprit webinar. Uh, this concludes uh, my portion here. Uh, once again, thanks for joining me, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it off now to Jerome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for uh, the presentation. Um, I just wanted to, once again, say thank you and introduce myself. I'm Jerome, the application specialist here for KME CNC, and uh, we will have a questions and answers after the presentation um, is, is completed. I just wanted to go through our short and brief presentation here. So KME Systems, um, we've been in business now for about 12 years focusing just on you know four plus one and three plus two fixturing um trying to get the best uh possible scenarios for your machines without cables so about seven years ago we introduced uh wireless systems for pallet pool applications and what that means is you don't have any cables or wiring going in your uh, horizontal machine centers whatsoever everything is powered self-powered with a uh, with a power supply um, we call it a, um, a power pack basically it's a uh, power cell um, it's made out of uh, lifey batteries lithium ions um, which is a really uh, high-end battery that is actually the same process cars are used to power the um, electric cars these days so we are all 
uh, in Irvine, California, 100% of our stuff is made here in the USA um, without the actual servo motors coming from Japan. This is our facility here in, in Irvine. We're uh, walking distance from John Wayne Airport. Um, we do all of our electronics here, all of our board soldering here. All the machining is done here on our premises. Um, nothing is subbed out. Uh, let's start with the tombstones. Um, there's a, several different applications for everybody's uh, uh, different, you know, size parts, uh, limitations and stuff like that. So we have a wide variety and the stuff I'm going to be showing you today is um, all stock on the shelf product. So the first one here on the left, it's a uh, TS 400 millimeter. That's two over two. And what the two over two means is it has two drives on one side and two drives on the other side. So as you do a B180 rotation, those platters will be directly in the same exact spot as you see it here facing you. And that's what those black covers are for. Those are actually the covers that cover up the servo motor and that's the encoder right in the back. So the next one on the right, that is our TS-400 2 over 2 tall. Um, that gives you a little bit, uh, you know, larger part rotation. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to mention is you can see how the platters are really close to the end of the actual tombstone. That's actually to advantage. Um, so that way you can use shorter tools. Um, you're going to get better surface finishing using shorter tools so you don't have to reach all the way to the middle of the actual tombstone. Um, the life expectancy of the tool is going to be better. Let's move on to the next slide. This is our 400 millimeter four over zero. So if you have a, an array of small parts, um, you can actually do a four over zero. Um, and those platters are 190 millimeters each, by the way, so you know what size they are. And that's our standard um, size for anything for 400 to 500 millimeter. And once it gets up to 630, the platters get a little bigger. So next slide, you'll see a 500 millimeter. This is a one over one, so it has one platter on the front side and one platter on the back. Same thing, 180 degree rotation. The platter's in the same exact spot, so it's easy for the operator to see where he's cutting, setting up parts and so forth. The picture on the right, that's our 500 two over zero. So if you don't have a you know high output shop, you can start with two drives. And uh, so that's two drives on the right side and there's nothing on the back. So that will give you an option to either just run the two drives or you can always send it back later and we can tear it down and put another two drives in there to give you a, a two over two later on in the future. So you can start off with a, a much cheaper unit. This next slide will show you it's a 500 millimeter one over zero and that has a 14 inch face plate. Um, that one has about 750 foot pounds of holding torque. And the uh, one on the right is a 630 millimeter tombstone. That's also one over zero. And as you can see, it's offset. So you can actually, um, the column is further back so you can put bigger parts on so you won't run out of Z clearance. I think there was one uh, prior to that too on the other slide previous to that. Um, this one has a 24 inch um, face plate on there. And that one has a 900 foot pounds of holding torque. And then we'll go to our next unit. This one is a really nice unit. We uh, built this one special for a customer in Torrance making automotive parts. Um, he has 350 um, parts, different parts that he puts on here. All of them have the same exact fixturing and um, all the same exact mounting. So uh, all the studs are mounted on the same exact position. So he's able to finish the parts in one operation. So he can get to the back of the unit because of the narrow column and he can get to all sides. So he's done everything in one operation completed. This is our trunnions. Uh, so this is like a three plus two applications for your vertical mills. Um, the one on top, that's our TR100. That's our standard unit. It has a um, 140 millimeter faceplate on that. And it's good for you know smaller parts up to eight inches. Um, 
The one on the bottom where it says RF, that is our radio frequency, so that's a wireless unit. You can see that the power supply is off to the left and that is integrated into the actual unit itself. So if you had a vertical with pallet pool, this would be a perfect scenario because you could put two of the KME um, trunnions in the machine at the same time working off of one control unit. This is our TR200 and uh, that's got two platters. And so that one has independency as well, just like the tombstones that you saw in the presentation. The actual pl platters, it's a C1 and a C2. So as you work on C1, you can move over to C2 and C1 will rotate into position just like the presentation showed you. The one on the bottom is our TR200RF. Once again, that's an integrated wireless system no cables in your machine whatsoever. And then this is our 300s. The 300s do not have a wireless option at the moment. Uh, we are working on that, but um, you'll see that the top one has the three platters. Those are 140 millimeters. And then the ones on the bottom where it says the 300X, those are 190 millimeters. And you can get the three the X's in all of our versions of Trunion. So you can do it on the TR100, 200, and the 300. So that will give you a larger platter. This is our XL. So this is our TR200 XL. And this is a, it's a really beefy unit that we made for really heavy applications for like stainless steel, um, titanium applications. We have a customer that uh, puts four parts of stainless steel on each platter cuts the heck out of it and uh, they're making 1300 pieces a day finished um, that pack that you see where it says remote pack on the description that's our power supply that's on the side of it and that uh, is in a pallet application so you can shuttle it in and out if you like this is our new indexer this is um, we just came out with this at the beginning no, I would say the middle of last year. This is our NDX 135RF. It's actually got a 140 millimeter faceplate on it now. This one is really nice. It's uh, You can see the holes on the top. Those are actually made for um, receiver studs. So like, you know, the Lang, the Juergens, um, all the actual uh, quick uh, five axis uh, receivers out there. Um, you put the studs on there so you can ha actually have a self-centering vise on the ear fixture. You can change it to a collet chuck. You can change it to a, a dovetail. And then, hey, I want to put the KME on there, so now you can. So this next slide will uh, show you the actual unit in motion here. That's the power pack. So we call that the power cell. Changes out that quickly fairly light it's a 96 millimeter center to center on the studs you can have up to four of these units in the same machine using the same controller and the same thing will be will uh, it would be C1, C2, C3, and C4, and that's how you would identify. So the next slide shows our four axes indexer. This is a 210, and the 210 also comes available with a side pack. Um, so you can actually put that in a pallet system as well um, with a um, remote pack. Then there it is right there. That's the remote pack. This is our 145-2, so the same thing goes. Uh, independent rotations, so you can work on one while the other one gets into position, so it's just gonna make your machining time faster. This is a great little unit with a lot of uh, torque. This is a um, 145 times four, so you can actually, if you're making like uh, hand suppressors for um, the AR-15, this is a perfect way to go. You can run four of them at a time. This is, uh, next slide is going to show us just your KME keypad. This is what it looks like. And so um, going back to the tombstones, um, we designed the tombstones to actually integrate into pallet pools um, because we wanted to make sure that, you know, 
when we used to do it with the couplers and you had pallet pull systems, you'd have to have one come in, one go out, and then we'd have to couple them uh, together pneumatically. And those things just never lasted. So when we came out with the wireless systems, you can have up to 40 KME tombstones in your pallet system at the same time. You can share them with four or five different machines using the same keypad. So each tombstone has its own address and it's radio frequency. It's not Bluetooth and it's not Wi-Fi. It's actual radio frequency and that's where the RFs come into play. So you can actually control um, three machines. You can actually have one tombstone go in one machine, exit go into the next machine and go into the next machine. So you can share any tombstone with any machine with the pallet pool system. That's called that's part of our smart technology that we have built into the actual brains of the units. So that's what the control unit looks like. It's magnetic. It doesn't even have to screw into your machine control at all. Um, the wires just go basically to your um, to your controller. Um, we actually put an I/O module in there that it connects to, and then it connects hardwire to the um, your fin signals and your M code relays. And so it's really easy in installation. This is uh, just showing you some different um, uh, pictures of pallet pool applications. These are all the actual machine tools that we've actually worked with and uh, installed the KMEs in. All of them are pretty much flawless. Every single company has the ability to um, work with the KMEs, just plug and play. And that's all I have for today, guys. Um, so go ahead and we'll, I'll bring this back to Grant and he will um, finish off the presentation for you. Okay, thank you guys. Good job on the presentations. All right, so this is gonna be a short Q and A because there were only a handful of questions. So we'll, we'll get through them and go from there. All right, so one of the, the first question was, is there a way to run a single vice to make sure all the tool offsets are correct? Um, and basically, and they also mentioned here that this could, um, what, or asking if you would use block skips for this, and that would certainly be an option. So for example, if you had a setup like what Grant had in the first um, demo there with multiple, multiple work pieces set up, you could use block skips if you want to just run the first part of the program, or you could also just group the operations belonging to the first part and post those and use that as your program to, um, to kind of prove things out. But also remember that you can rely on the, the Esprit simulation as well. And let's see, there was another, I'll, uh, Jerome, I'll let you and uh, Tom take care of the next one. It, it's a uh, question, is it possible to have hydraulic or pneumatic clamping activation through each rotary for robot tending? Okay, so um, when it comes to robot tending and hydraulic or pneumatic clamping, um, there isn't a way to actually go through the tombstone to the machine control, but we've actually worked with several different um, fixed string companies that will build like a um, a rotary to where, in fact, that that long skinny tombstone that you saw that was for the automotive industry, they actually have uh, hydraulics uh, built onto their fixed string, and it, and it basically they just plug it in um, each time, and it releases, and then they uh, disconnect it, and it locks down. So. We've worked with several different companies where you can actually use hydraulic or pneumatic and they'll build like a sleeve around our, our face plate and that will give you the able to charge it and, and discharge it. But actually having it through the machine tool, um, hydraulics, no, it's not possible because everything is direct drive. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so the only, let's see, the only other, Real question was just um, uh, as far as the spree is concerned was about the version that we're using. So this is the new Esprit uh, version 4.6 and it is available for download. So if anyone is is interested in, in using it, they can 
just email support at dbtechnology.com. Yeah, I think there's one more KME question here. Where's that? Uh, about the battery runtime. What's the expected battery runtime and, and battery life? Yeah, so on the battery, on the power cells, what we actually, uh, we'll build a unit to where it'll hold a minimum of eight hours of machine time. And that machine time is calculated while it's turned on in the actual machine envelope. When it comes out of the back of the machine, it usually shuts off. And that's where, at the very beginning, Grant showed you a, a sample uh, program. It was a P8011, and that basically turns on the actual unit itself. And then at the end of the program, you have a P8013 program, which is a macro, and that will shut it off as it comes out of the out of the horizontal machining center. So uh, really briefly, you're to answer your questions about eight hours in the machine envelope and we can get extended batteries and we actually try to um, talk to our customers and have them just change out the batteries every lunch break and then that way they don't um, ever have to think about it there is a, a warning on the KME keypad and it alarms out and then it holds on the actual M code itself when the batteries do get low and that's a setting that you can set at like 35% consumption. So when the battery gets down to 35%, it'll alarm out and just pause your machine at that point. But you can lower that to 25. It comes st standard uh, when we ship it out at 25%, but you can adjust it to any any um, any percentage you'd like, um, depending on what your runtime is on your actual part it's, uh, itself. Okay. Uh, I guess this one could go to either, but um, probably better, Jerome, if you answer about the uh, the question concerning the M codes. So no. is that is it just an M code to control the indexes? Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, basically uh, a line of G code would look like uh, would look like this. It would just be G65. So you're calling up a macro, and then uh, you would call up either your staging macro or your confirmation macro. And the difference is, is like uh, when you're, say you're machining on C1 or your first platter, that's C1. When you pull off of that thing, you can actually uh, throw in your your uh, G code for, or your macro for it to just basically rotate without a confirmation. That's your 8030 program. Um, if you want it to confirm, then you would just use the 8020. So your line would be G65, 8020, because I want it to confirm. And then you would select your drive. So that would be C1 and then A for angle. So if you want it to go 180 degrees, it would be A180 and then point. Um, you can go negative numbers. You can go positive numbers uh, all the way to 999.999. Um, and then, you know, back to zero, you can actually do 125.123 if you want. So, I mean, you can, it, it, it's endless. You can, whatever angle you need, it'll go there. Okay. Actually, we, I think we have a program. Grant, do you have a, a program that you could pull up real quick just to show yeah, the yeah, attendees sure. what the, uh, what the program looks like? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, just a line of code where the macro's at. Yeah. And then while he's pulling that up, there was, let's see, one other question. Oh, about the controller. So this is for KME. It looks like you're using your own controller. So do I need to have a fourth, fifth axis controller on the machine? No, you do not. So um, we supply... So basically, you could you don't have to uh, invest any additional dollars to buy finite controllers. Um, ours isn't; it's not full five axes. It's positional. So basically, it's cut and burn, cut and burn. So um, it's it's uh, so you can get to all five sides the best way possible, and um, so you don't need to invest in any other drivers. Uh, we connect to your actual controllers, so. The KME keypad is only to um, set your zero points. Once you set your zero home position, then you don't have to touch that keypad ever again, in, unless you need to. Okay. And Grant here's the um, the program Grant has put up. 
Yeah, so we can see here, this the, we're talking about originally, here's the power on code. Um, here's those uh, 80, 30, and 80, 20 codes. And then if we continue down, like uh, Jerome said at the end of the program, we then have a, another macro call to turn the unit back off. Yeah, that's the 80-12, perfect. Okay. All right. It looks so, like Greg back to home too, right before he shuts it off, he sends it back to home. Yeah, they, yeah exactly. We, we send, we send the, the positions back to home and then we turn, the, turn it back off again. Yeah, cool. Okay. All right. I think we, I think we addressed everything, answered all the questions at this point. If there was a question out there that we didn't answer during the Q and A, we'll follow up with you individually via email once the session is over. But thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Grant and Jerome. Appreciate your presentations and information. Thank you. And be on the lookout for the next one. Yeah, th thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Thanks again, guys.